All right, today we're going to talk about conservative vector fields. So recall that we know the conservative vector field, F, is a gradient field for some scalar function, F. And a reminder, scale is just a fancy word for uh, like outputs of a number. So if a vector field is a gradient field, then the vector field is equal to the gradient of F. Um, the scalar function f is called a potential function for that field. We learned how to check if a given function was a potential function by checking if the partials of our potential potential function match the components of the field. So now we're going to expand upon some of these properties of conservative vector fields and learn how to use these uh, use and apply potential functions. But first, we need a few definitions. Um, and these actually mostly have to do with the formal definitions uh, a lot of the concepts that we'll see. And I leave those to the textbooks. Uh, if you want to look up the formal definitions, I try and present sort of an intuitive approach, which isn't always as formal. So anyway, types of curves and regions. Curves, uh, a closed curve shares the same initial and endpoint. Uh, and a simple curve is a non-self intersecting curve. So as a closed curve, we have a quick example here. Well, there's a link that we'll see, but a closed curve would just be something like the unit circle starts and stops at the same point. The technical definition is that there exists a parametrization that begins and ends at the same point. Um, so yeah, you could parametrize this any number of ways, but it always have the same initial and starting initial point and end point is an intuitive way to think about it. Non-self intersecting curves, well, starts here, goes over there. What would be a problem? Well, this curve could do that. And that would be a non-simple curve because it intersected itself. Um, so it turns out simple and closed curves will be uh, important here. So let's have an example of this of a closed curve that is not simple. Well, um, well, we'll see that actually here. All right. So here's an example of a closed curve that is not simple. Um, and the blue dot there, when I hit, when I drag this uh, thing, you'll see it progress as it kind of travels along its trajectory along the curve, and then starts and stops at the very same endpoint. Um, so there's an example. So here's a simple curve that is not closed. You just take half of, well, not half. Yeah, kind of half of that curve. It's where, yeah, let's see. Whoops, I can't turn that off without, let's get that out of there. All right, so here's a nice, whoops. Oh yeah, you get the idea. It's uh, simple, but it's not closed because it doesn't share the same. Wait, it's, it's not simple, it crosses itself. I labeled my things incorrectly. So this is not simple and not closed because it crosses itself and doesn't share the same initial and endpoints. And then when it came time to uh, put a come up with an example for a simple closed, I didn't get too creative. Once again, I just used the circle. Simple closed, same starting and ending point and not, not self intersecting. Okay, so now let's talk about regions. Since we're not always gonna be working in uh, the plane, you know, connected region, we use the word region to talk about a region in three space or beyond. Uh, a connected region is defined to be any two points in the region R, there exists a smooth path connecting them and uh, that's contained entirely in the region. And then a simply connected region is any simple closed curve, so it doesn't self intersect and it has the same endpoint and start point within the region R can be continuously shrunk to a point without leaving the region. So let's do a couple examples here. Here's a couple examples of connected regions. You know, just some kind of a region with two points in it. And for these any two points, you can find a path. It doesn't matter what path you take. As long as there's a path that stays inside of that region, it's a connected region. So connected regions can also kind of have holes in them, you know? So if I've got a point on this side and a point on this side, I can still find a path between those that is a smooth path connecting those two points. Um, now, simply connected, intuitively, at least in the plane, um, you can think of it as just no holes allowed. So simply connected. Let's say here we want to take a path. That's got to be a, a simple closed curve. So there we go. There's our, I'll make that a little thicker for the start and end point. And you could actually choose any point on this line. But let's just imagine we kind of wanted to shrink this thing down and continuously deform it onto the start and end point. Well, you could uh, just kind of shrink this thing down. And I think you can see that if you could scale that 
curve, you could collapse it down and you'd have no problem. You would stay within the region. You wouldn't exit the region. However, with our example that has a hole in the region, let's uh, look at another similar simple cl closed curve. There's our nice simple closed curve, which hits the initial and terminal point perfectly, as you can see. However, if we tried to deform this, there's gonna, we're going to run into a problem. This part of the curve is going to have to kind of that oh, that uh that hole, so to speak, is going to get in the way. We're not going to have any problems over here on the left, so to speak, but on the right, we're going to get in the way, and we're never going to be able to collapse this thing. About as good as we're ever going to do is we're going to be able to collapse this thing down into a real thin loop that kind of goes around that hole, and so that is not a simply connected region. So yeah, these definitions apply to three space and beyond. So before we go deeper into this, let's take a look at just kind of what we used to know. And again, this is real informal, but the fundamental theorem of calculus, I found it helpful and past students have said, that, hey, that's a nice way to look at it. If you look in the book, it's always more complicated. We'll see that on the next slide. But intuitively, when we're integrating in one variable, we're asking the question, hey, this integrand is the derivative of what function? And then if we're using a definite integral with limits of integration, if we can find that so-called kind of parent or I don't know, dare I say potential function, uh, we can just evaluate that potential function or that parent function at the ends of the limits of integration. Formally, it's usually written like this, where we use the formal word of antiderivative. It's not a direct, direct correlation between the, the derivative as the integrand and then the sort of parent function. Why? Because there's an infinite family of parent functions by adding on constants of integration plus C um, that give us that derivative. And so we call those that family of things that give us this derivative antiderivatives. And so capital F is our antiderivative and little f is the, the, the so-called derivative inside. I just thought that was a little bit confusing. Now that I'm looking at it, I'm sort of regretting going down this road because we're gonna use capital F and little f to be different things here for the rest of the uh, lecture, but I think it's gonna be okay. Okay, with that in mind, scratch that prior one from your memory and just look at this one. And hopefully that makes a little bit of intuitive sense. And that's kind of how you think about integration, hopefully. So let's see. Okay, so we're building towards something called the fundamental theorem of line, line integrals. Um, and again, there's a niche because I'm not going to be formal here because uh, we're not yet ready for that. And I'll leave the formality to the book. So let little f be a potential function. So it's not a bold, it's in lowercase, it's a scalar function, outputs a real number for a vector field, capital F, and c be a curve with initial point a and terminal point b. Then under the right circumstances, we can take a line integral. Um, and turn it into, well, there's just a direct substitution happening here. If F is the same thing, uh, if it has a potential function, then it's a conservative field. So F, capital F is the field for the gradient field for little f. And if we can find out what little f is, hey, it turns out that we can just evaluate little f at the endpoints of that integral or the endpoints of our path. And, and I didn't write this one in here, but why don't we add this? Why don't we add? A, B, this is sometimes written like this, where we have it written like that. And here, you can kind of see a little bit of a parallel between the, in single variable calculus, you've got this, the quote derivative as your integrand. We're thinking of the gradient as sort of the quote derivative of its sort of parent function. We're calling that parent function, the potential function. So it's really very, very similar to, um, Yes, and actually, the fundamental theorem of calculus can be uh, can be just an application of this fundamental theorem of line integrals. But all right, so it looks pretty similar. And what I'm trying to get at is think of the gradient f uh, like an antiderivative. Uh, dare I say, let's call it a potential function for f. Is is kind of the same parallel here. All right, so. New concept, path independence. Conservative vector fields fact are path independent. So that begs the question, what does path independence mean? So path independence for a vector field, if you have a vector field F defined on some domain D, you let C1 and C2 be any two curves in D with the same initial and terminal points, then the line integral of F along those two curves is gonna be equal. It's path independent. As long as you share the same initial and terminal points, regardless of the path you take uh, to integrate along you're going to get the same answer. Okay, and that's 
uh, that says line integrals over a different paths will be the same. So if you have a conservative vector field, you have path independence, but it doesn't go the other direction as easily. You need a little extra um, criteria, hence some of the vocabulary at the beginning of this. Uh, if you have that D is an open connected domain, then if you have path independence, you can find conservativeness. But as you might imagine, it's fairly hard to prove path independence because there can be probably an infinite number of paths between any two points and you have to show that they're all the same uh, with respect to taking the line integral over that, that path. So we're gonna find a different way to determine things are conservative. However, you can use this to show that a field is not conservative by showing that the line integral over two different paths is different. Okay, here's how we are going to show a vector field is conservative. We're gonna find a potential function for that field. That's pretty much the definition of potential function. So if you can find a potential function, you have shown it's conservative. Okay, so again, single variable calculus, informally, we integrate a derivative to find an antiderivative. So you integrate 2x, you got x squared plus any constant c. x squared has the derivative 2x. So what about if we let other variables come into the game? We've got 2xy this time. Again, we can integrate that with respect to x. We just get uh, x squared times y. But then instead of just adding on any old constant, we now have to open up the idea that the constant of integration can depend on the other variables. So that's why we're using uh, C of Y, because the derivative, if you take the derivative of any uh, expression only in terms of Y, and you're taking the derivative with respect to X, you're going to get zero, and so it's not gonna show up. So in finding potential functions, we need to address the fact that any constant of integration can't, that arrive can be dependent on other variables that we haven't addressed yet. So the process, we'll get to the process, but I'm gonna do a couple examples just to get us started. So the setup is this, we're given a vector field F, capital F, I'll try and remember to say capital F. And uh, our goal is to find a scalar function, little f, such that uh, little f is the gradient of capital F or capital F is the gradient of little f. So how could we do this? Well, uh, if we are given the field, we could think of the field as the partials of our potential function. So we could just integrate all the partials and compare. And this will work sometimes, but not always, but let's try it on this one. So our field is uh, its x component, which we're gonna think of as the partial of this potential function, because we're trying to find a potential function, little f, that gives us these partials. So the, the x component of our field is, 3x squared plus y uh, plus x, and then the y component of our field is x to the third power plus one. So we wanna show it's conservative and we're gonna do that by finding a potential function f. So like I kind of notated up there, that's f of x, this is f of y. If this is gonna be true, we'll be in that situation. So we're gonna take and I apply an idea, we're gonna integrate with respect to x. I'm gonna abbreviate with respect to as wrt from here on out. Okay, so if we do that, I say, hey, let's 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 grab what we think to be partial with respect to x, and let's integrate it and see what we get. So integrating the partial with respect to x, we get x to the third power y plus x squared. Then we remember to tack on that constant of integration. Since we're just dealing with x and y here, our constant of integration is just going to be c of y. If it we're in three dimensions, it would be c of y and z. Okay, so we've got kind of a guess, and I like to label my, my guesses, if you will, my candidate functions for the potential function that we're looking for to be f tilde or f hat or something just to differentiate them, to know that it's, it's in the process of being revised. I'm not there yet. So now we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna integrate with respect to y. We're gonna, we're gonna take a look this time at the y partial and say, hey, let's integrate that y partial and see what we get. So integrating x to the third plus one with respect to y, we get x to the third times y plus y. And this time, instead of tacking, I'm not gonna reuse the letter C because who knows, maybe it could be a different expression. I'm gonna tack on a capital D of x. Because again, this, if we took the derivative with respect to y of this expression, we would get this uh, 
if everything on d of x was a was a expression with only terms of x in it or constants. Okay, so so far we've got kind of two guesses for what our potential function might be, f, f tilde, if you will, kind of summarizing them up as we go. So now we have to compare these things. Well, comparing these things, I kind of say, all right, well, it looks like that might be the case. And it sort of looks like this might be the case. And what happens if we put all of that together? Will we have found something that works? And really the only way to find this is to test it. So putting that together, we're revising our candidate and saying, hey, now our new candidate is uh, F tilde is X to the third Y plus X squared plus Y, taking into account those two kind of things that we have. And so are we right, begs the question. So we'll check it. We will calculate the partial with respect to X of our guess. So here we're, we're calculating the partial with respect to X here of our guess and checking it against our known, uh, what the partial with respect to F should be of our potential function, partial with respect to X rather. So yeah, calculating that, we see that it matches and similar logic, we'll go ahead and calculate the partial with respect to Y of our guess and note that it matches what we want it to. And so we've done it. We have found a function, a potential function for to show that uh, our field F is conservative. I wrote it as for conservative F so I could fit it all in one page. Um, so, so one more comment before we move on. Wouldn't this also work? Now using just not, this is a different C than that. It's just a generic plus C like we like to do when we're integrating to represent any constant scale or any number. And sure enough, it, it does. But in general, since we could choose any number, we're gonna, we're gonna do the same thing we do when we're, like we did in, in Calc 1, you know, if you integrate 2X from zero to one DX, you didn't say it's two, whoops, X squared plus C, plus C evaluated from zero to one, but rather you said, let's just choose X squared. Uh, let's just choose C to be zero and evaluate it like that. And that's what we're gonna do as well. We're gonna say, okay, we've found a family of potential functions. That's why I kind of emphasize, it doesn't really show up, but italicize that A potential function. We're gonna just take the constant always to be zero. So that was fun. Let's do a more challenging example. This time we wanna show that this field is conservative. X component, uh, 2XY, Y component, X squared plus 2YZ to the third power and Z component, 3Y squared Z squared plus 2Z. And we wanna show that it's conservative. And so to do that, we're gonna find a potential function for this thing. So our goal is to find that little scalar F potential function such that the partial of F matches our X component of our field, the partial of Y matches the Y component of our field, and the partial of Z matches the Z component of our field. So once again, we're gonna take the same approach. We're gonna integrate each partial and compare results. We're gonna go a little bit quicker here. So kind of the, this is gonna jump around, the slide, the words are gonna jump around a little bit, but it's just cause I'm adding in things at each step. So, okay, with respect to X, we'll integrate our F, our partial with respect to X, and that will generate a sort of candidate function. And that candidate function will be this little guy right there. Once you integrate the, what should be the F? Because remember here, if, if this is true, if this thing has a potential function, then these are going to be the partials of that potential function with respect to each variable. So that worked out. Now we've got one guess there. Summarize that, we added that in down there to keep track of what we're doing. Now we're gonna integrate with respect to Y, the Y partial, and we'll get our next sort of guess. Add that in down below. And then we'll do it with respect to Z. And once again, we'll get a third guess and we'll add that in below and put it all together and see what we got. Hopefully I have one more click there. So yeah. Now everything's summarized relatively nicely right there. And uh, so I don't know, we're not ready for this yet. So pretend it doesn't say that yet. It, it, we have to do something first. What we have to do is kind of put it together and make an initial guess. We have to take all the information we have and, and collapse it down into one guess. And so my guess is going to be F tilde of X comma Y. I'm not gonna write X, Y that we're gonna run out of room. Okay. so our our candidate for our potential function, well, I see it needs 
it needs. Let's see, we, we got this here. I'm gonna just play with some highlighters here for a second. Let's see here. This is similar to that. Those are the same. And then we've got this little pesky guy right there. All right, so what? which one of these could match up? Well, um, it looks to me like C of YZ could be my Y squared plus Z or times Z to the third power expression. And then uh, what else have we got here? We've got an expression in X and Y, X squared times Y. So that could be E of Y, X. And then the remaining thing here, D of X, it could depend on X and Z, but the only thing we have left is something that just depends on Z and that, that's okay too. It doesn't have to depend on all the variables. So let's see, I'm gonna put all this together and write this as, um, my guess as x squared y plus y squared z to the third power plus z squared, including all of those pieces. And so let's see, how close are we? Let's compare, let's check our answer. So here's our final candidate, what I just wrote out like that. Let's, uh, let's see if we're correct, let's check. So to, to check, we're gonna once again verify that the partials of our candidate function match the field components like we need them to. And sure enough, if you run down the all three, uh, the partial with respect to x, well, that's gonna be two x, y, and then the other two expressions are gonna be zero. And then the partial with respect to y, uh, that's gonna become one, so x squared, and that's gonna be two y, so and then this guy's gonna go away. Yep, and so that's gonna match up. And then lastly, if you take the partial with respect to z, you'll see that it matches as well. So we've done it. We've found out that F, our field, capital F is conservative and it, we found the potential function which shows. And notice we didn't write plus capital C, we just took that to be zero. All right, so if that felt a little hand wavy and, and sort of a little guessy and checky and, and this example worked out, but it felt like perhaps this won't always work, that's, that's a pretty good intuition. And so that method seems a little guess and checky and sometimes it does work, but there is another kind of more algorithmic approach to this. And this kind of more, generally more successful and, and the approach that will work more reliably is this. First thing we do is we integrate to get a candidate function. Just like we have been, we pick a partial and then integrate it with respect to that variable. Then you differentiate the result that you got with respect to a different variable and you compare that to the partial that it should be, the component of the field. You may need to integrate the constant function that you got as part of the original integration in step one to revise your guess and then just keep repeating steps two and three until you finally narrow down what it is. And that, that sounds like a lot. Without seeing anything done, that is a lot. So let's, let's work through this example with it. So we're gonna work the exact same example again and see that we get the same result. So we're going to start by integrating any of our, our partials things that we know that they need to be the partial of the potential functions. We're gonna integrate them. I picked Y. Why did I pick Y? It's just got more information to it. It's got two terms rather than just the single term that we have in for X. And so I said, hey, got more information here. Let's see how that goes. So once we integrate that, what we did here is we integrated this with a Y component and we got our initial guess. So F tilde on the left is guessed as X squared Y plus Y to the second, z to the third plus, and now since I integrated with respect to y, my constant that could show up could depend on x or z and wouldn't show up as part of that integration. So now we have that much information. What do we need to do? Well, we need to differentiate it with respect to a different variable. And once again, I chose z instead of x. Why that? Because z, uh, it doesn't really matter if I use the same color, z has, has more, uh, more information. It's got just got more stuff to it. So so I took the derivative of my candidate above, you know, this little guy. I'm gonna take the derivative of that with respect to z, so the partial, and that gives us three y squared z to the second power plus, I'm using a little subscript notation on capital C there to represent that this is a derivative, a partial derivative of our C func capital C function with respect to z. Okay, so now we have to compare that. What are we going to compare it to? Well, f of z, whoops, whoops, let's get some actual highlighter going on. 
Yeah. This should match the partial with respect to f of our potential function, the z component. And so we need to check and see how close we are, what's going on. Do we match or not? So on this next line, we should have that pop up. Let's see what I just highlighted there. Let's see, is that true? Well, when I look at it, I notice that the difference between what I got in this line and what's up here is this 2z. Writing them kind of right on top of each other, the what we need it to be first, and then the candidate second, we see that, okay, the first bit's the same, that's great. Our candidate has this. So we know that of this constant function of integration that showed up, the partial with respect to z is equal to 2z. So we can use that information and we can integrate just that part. We can integrate that blue two to the z, which is equal to the z partial of our c function to kind of revise our guess. And once we do that, we integrate two z with respect to z to get z squared. Um, now we've taken care of the z component. What have we done so far? What, have we, what information have we used? We've used the y, uh, we've now used the z and related the z component. And so the only remaining variable is x. And hence, when I presented this kind of step-by-step -step process, it was repeat steps two and three. Now we're gonna do the same kind of game with x. So let's see what we've got here. So yeah, our revised candidate, all summarized and put together, is x squared y plus y squared z to the third plus z squared. And how did that revision come about? Well, we have our initial guess right here that we kind of did something to, we differentiated it, and then we use that differentiated thing to integrate it again and get a and find out that this guy and this show up. And so we put that all together to get our new revised guess replacing capital C of X Z with Z squared plus C of X. Okay, so now repeat steps two and three is needed. Well, we the only thing we haven't dealt with is that X variable. So we're gonna differentiate with respect to X and compare the partial to what it should be. So differentiating our new candidate expression with respect to X gives us two X Y. And now C of X, I could just put c primed of x, because we're just now down to a single variable, but I don't want to emphasize that we're using all the information we're given. And so I use the subscript notation there to show that c sub x is the partial derivative of c with respect to x of the function c of x. Okay, so now we're going to compare that. Does our guess partial match up with the partial that we need it to be? In other words, is this the same as what we have it guessed to be? If you're looking at it and seeing that, oh, it's pretty close. It looks like we got plus zero here. You're right. So from that comparison, we can tell that our partial of C with respect to X is zero. So now how do we can make the conclusion that C of X, just the regular function is zero? Well, we would integrate C of X, the derivative of this function with respect to X with respect to X. Integrating that should give us that kind of parent function. Again, we're kind of playing fast and loose with the idea that we integrate a derivative to find that parent or function. So this is zero. And from that logic, integrating zero, well, you could be any constant C. And since we're doing plus constant plus C, that's not doesn't depend on X. It's not a variable. We don't have to worry about it. We can just take it to be zero. So I didn't actually take it to B0. I actually included it on this guess when I typed this up. Um, and that's nice. It works. But in general, we take it to zero. So once again, we're not yet confident. It seems like things are going to work out. But it only takes a second to check and make sure that these things do, in fact, match with what they should. Get that tilde out of there. So we'll do it. Calculating the partial of our guess, our, po our potential potential function. That's terrible use of that. Sorry. Um, Calculating the partial of our guess, checking it against what it needs to be, absolutely, with respect to x, y, and z, you'll see that it works out. So we've done it. We found the exact same function, and we took capital C to be 0, and we got two different processes to arrive at the same answer. This one might seem harder at first, and it does seem pretty hard at first, but getting once you give it a try and practice a few of them, you'll find that you can get pretty good at the, doing these. So. To summarize kind of what we just saw, there are two kind of 
sort of summaries of methods I wrote down to find these. You'll see different approaches to these in the textbooks and things, but this is kind of a summary to them. So the first one we saw was just to integrate each partial with respect to its variable and compare the results and kind of guess from there and then just check your guess and continue on. The second method, the more algorithmic one, the one that'll pretty much always work is integrate, differentiate, integrate that result, revise and repeat the thing we just did. So integrate to get a candidate function with respect to a particular variable, differentiate it with respect to a different variable and compare that to what the partial should be. And then compare those and integrate your constant function as needed. The example we just did. So now we're ready to talk about the fundamental theorem. So before we do that, why we've been talking about potential functions this whole time. So why are potential functions useful? Well, if you have that f is conservative, it's the same thing as being saying that f is a potential function or a, is a is a gradient field for some potential function. And we know that if f is conservative, it gives us path independence. And so the fundamental line theorem says if f is conservative and it has potential function little f, sorry, I'm forgetting to say capital F. Let D be a connected domain containing points A and B, and let C be any path contained in D from A and B. Why is that? Why does it just say any path? We don't need to know the curve. Well, we have path independence if you have a conservative field, and we do. So we don't necessarily need to do the whole parametrization of the path and calculate the manual um, line integral, because sometimes that can be very, very hard, much harder than finding a potential function, which is why this is useful. Then we can turn our line integral into just find the potential function and evaluating it at the end points. So very, very, very similar to what we do in Calc 1. I mean, it, it looks similar. I mean, if I write this as a to, well, sometimes it's not, no, 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 no. So sometimes this is written as a, b, capital F, dr, f of b minus f of a. There we go. And that looks awful similar to that kind of informal idea we were talking about earlier. We typically use lower cases when we're working with single variable calculus, but there's nothing stopping us from using a, cap, a capital letter. Okay, so let's do it. Let's apply the fundamental theorem of line integrals. We wanna uh, integrate over any a curve from the origin to one, 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 to, and we're gonna integrate over the field x component 2x e to the y times z plus e to the x times z for the x component. The y component is x squared e to the y z and the z component is x squared e to the y plus e to the x. All right, so what do we need to do? Well, the idea is we want to identify a potential function f, uh, little f for our field f so we can use and apply the fundamental theorem of uh, line integrals. Right, so we're gonna do this. Uh, I forgot to make a whole bunch of blank slides after this. So we'll have to kind of remember this. So let me do something really quick and I'll pause the video. All right, there we go. We're prepped for the next pages, should we need them and hint, hint, we will. So, okay, let's see, what do we got? What's our setup here? Well, our setup here is that A is gonna be the point zero, zero, our initial point, and B is gonna be our point one, one, one. And our goal is we need to find little f such that the gradient of little f is equal to capital F. Okay, and so this means that this needs to be a partial with respect to x of little f, this needs to partial with respect to y of little f, and this needs to be the partial with respect to z of little f. And I'm going to have this page here for a second. So might as well just kind of highlight those guys so we can kind of look at them a little bit. Okay, so we got our goal. We got everything we know when we've kind of labeled a few things. So we're gonna use that, this sort of algorithmic process here. And since I don't have a ton of room, I'm gonna erase that goal. Again, so the first thing we're gonna do is we're going to integrate. We can choose any partial we want to. We can choose the partial with respect to x, y, or z. I'm gonna choose x. And so f tilde is going to be the integral of f of x, or um, the partial with respect to x, which is the integral of that x expression component for our field. 
2x e to the y z plus e to the x z. We're integrating with respect to x. We go ahead and do this. The integral of 2x with respect to x is x squared. Everything else comes along for the ride. Um, integral of e to the x is just e to the x. Now we have to tack on that constant of integration. And our constant of integration could depend on y or z. So we'll make sure and include that. OK, that's great. So now we better compare it to something. But in order to do that, we're going to compare it to, we're going to say, hey, is our guess equal to what we know a partial with respect to y should be? So I chose to integrate with respect to y and compare it next. OK, so um, this is my initial guess. And so taking the partial, let's see the line here. Maybe this, there we go, that's kind of nice. All right, so now the partial of my guess, my candidate function, so to speak, with respect to y is x squared e to the y z, because the derivative of e to the y is just e to the y, and everything else comes along for the ride. This gives me 0, because there's no y term. And here, since it could depend on y, I would get a partial of c with respect to y, and it would depend on y and z. We're going to compare that to so I should write differentiate slash compare. We're going to compare that to the known what we need it to be up there at the top, highlighted in red. We need this thing to be x squared e to the y z. OK, so now taking a look at all of this together, we can kind of make a conclusion. This tells us that the derivative of that c, the partial derivative of c to the c, depending on y and z, is 0. That doesn't mean that c of y, z is 0, but rather that says that the partial of, of the function c, y, comma, z equals 0. It could still depend on z. And so this basically tells us that, OK, there's no y expression, but c might still depend on z. It doesn't depend on y. And so from this, we're going to be able to make a revised guess, which we'll do on the next page. OK, we've got our field just written there for uh, being able to see it. And so we're going to revise our guess, or candidate if you prefer. OK, revising our guess, what do we get? We get f is equal to x squared e to the y z um, plus e to the x power times z plus our c of x. We know it doesn't depend on y from our last comparison and differentiating. So now we have to repeat steps two and three. We need to differentiate again. But what have we used? I'm going to use, uh, I don't know, red for, it doesn't matter. It's just a color. What have we used so far? I, uh, I started with x. And so that's been, that information has been used. We checked it against y. So that information has been used. So now if we're going to differentiate it again, we better differentiate with respect to z. So I'll stick with blue. Why not? We're going to differentiate with respect to z. And then we're going to compare that result, integrating as necessary, if necessary. OK, so differentiating with respect to z is going to give me f hat or z, our f tilde, whatever it's supposed to be. Uh, taking the derivative of that thing with respect to z, we're just going to get x squared e to the y, because the derivative of z is 1, and everything else comes along for the ride. Similarly, we're going to get e to the z x power, rather. And then we're going to get you could write this as c primed of z, but I'm going to once again emphasize that that is a derivative with respect to z. It can only depend on z. OK, so let's compare this. Now we're going to compare this. Let's compare it to what we know it needs to be. Um, I don't know, maybe for clarity's sake, we'll use uh, f of z there. OK, so f of z is equal to x squared e to the y plus e to the x. That's what we want it to be. Our guess has an extra term on it. And so we can kind of look at this and we can say, all right, this tells me that c, the partial of z with respect to c, the partial of c with respect to z is 0. And so this implies that the function c of z doesn't actually depend on z. And it's actually a, it, it's a constant. It exists in the real numbers. But it doesn't depend on z. And that's the key there. And so we can take this now. And we can revise our guess one more time. And so here's our final, our final candidate, final revision. 
So our guess is that f is equal to x squared e to the y power z plus e to the x z. And now we need to check it. We need to check it against the partials that we want them to be. So uh, the partial with respect to x is going to be 2x e to the y z plus e to the x z. The partial with respect to y is going to be x squared e to the y z, same expression because of the way e works, plus zero. And then the partial with respect to z is going to be x squared e to the y plus e to the x. Do these things match? Well, let's highlight them. Does this match this? Absolutely. Does this match this? Absolutely. And does this match this? Absolutely. So we'll give ourselves three little green checks because we did great. We nailed this thing. OK, so that wasn't the end. What we know and what we can conclude here from this so far is so we know now we're going to drop the uh, little tilde because now it's we're confident now we know the answer. Uh, F is x squared e to the y uh, z plus e to the x z is a potential function for my field capital F, which is as a result, since we found a, cons uh, a, a potential function, we know that it has to be a conservative field. And so we can now use the fundamental theorem to answer the question we were asked. Our original question was, the Latin integral over C, but where C is any path from 0, 0, 0 to 1, 1, 1. Well, since F is a gradient field, we've now said that, all right, this can be evaluated by just evaluating our potential function at our limits of integration. So let me actually rewrite that. Let me write that as, okay. This is gonna be a lower limit of integration, zero, zero, zero as our initial point, one, one, one as our terminal point, gradient field of F dr is F evaluated at one, one, one minus F of zero, zero, zero. I'm now realizing that I haven't written F on this page, so we probably should since we're gonna use it. So I just use a little blue parenthetical here. F is equal to X squared E to the Y Z plus E to the X Z. And then put a pin in this, this is that. And we'll pick up that calculation now that we can tell what F is. F of one, one, one is one squared E to the one power times one plus E to the one times one minus, now we're gonna do, um, okay, this was this. I'll go ahead and use another color here, red for this. This is gonna be zero times e to the zero times zero again, plus e to the zero times zero. Yep, all those zeros are gonna give us a whole bunch of zero there. And that first expression simplifies down to e plus e, which is two e, and we've done it. And that brings us to a close, uh, our conversation about conservative vector fields.